Welcome to the next lecture in the Bridges uh, to the Future series. Today we will discuss um, pre-stress concrete bridge structures. Uh, it will be an introduction to bridge post-tension technology. Uh, the issue uh, of concrete post-tension structures has already been raised on the occasion of lectures about concrete structures one year later. Uh, but as you will see, the approach of bridges to this technology is somewhat different and much more practical, which is uh, mainly because tensioning is used very often in bridges. About 80% of modern bridges are currently stru concrete structures, and more uh, than half of them are post-tension or pre-stressed. It is worth knowing that this technology uh, doesn't apply only to concrete structures because, because you can stress every kind of structure and material. The only thing, you just have to be able to do it and of course not be afraid to use force in design actively. The reason for that I will show you in a moment. Today we will discuss the differences between rainfalls and pre-stressed concrete and define the essence of pre-stressing. Then a brief history of concrete stressing and examples of milestones in post-tension technology, post-tension bridges. Finally, some details about the post-tensioning technology. Uh, even with the reinforcement, it cannot be maintain uh, its properties and, and uh, unfortunately looks like this corroding footbridge. Unfortunately, durability is much less than that of reinforced glass. However, certainly reinforced concrete will not allow us to build such structures as this ribbon footbridge. For this, we need tensioning. Um, Let's look at this simple experiment that you can repeat yourself. We will use for this a small piece of spong. If we cut it at the bottom, we can simulate the cracks that may appear in the reinforced concrete beam. By applying a load to it, you can see that the cracks open with a beam deflection. Removing the load restores the original deflection line and closes the cracks. This happens every time uh, um, when a heavy vehicle enters the reinforced concrete span of the bridge. But now we will do some modifications uh, to our spong. Well, uh, let's imagine that we, we drill in it an elongated hole, but located in the lower part and not in the center of gravity of the cross section. Through the gap, we now move the, the elastic rubber, at the ends of which we put two sticks used to tighten the rubber and anchor it. What will happen to our spong then? Well, if the rubber were located on the axis of the spong in the center, it would only shorten the entire spong, why say beam, uh, but, but the rubber runs closer to the lower fibers of the spong. Therefore, after tensioning, the beam will be will bend upwards. The bottom fibers will shorten more than the top ones, and this will force the inverse deflection of the beam. And what else will happen? Well, this way will increase the load capacity of the entire beam. Note that after tensioning, applying the same load as before, it no longer opens the cracks. There is also less deflection. Of course, we can imagine such a load, which, however, will open our cracks. Well, we can also even break our rubber. But it would be would have, uh, uh, but it would have to be a, a much larger load than than the one at the beginning. So, what is the importance of tensioning for structure engineers? Um, to increase the span of the bridge, uh, the designer could thus simply increase the cross-section size of the, of the beam. This is how you were taught uh, 
even on the strand of materials lectures. But unfortunately, this is always associated with an increase in the self weight of the bridge. So there are some limitations to this approach. Unfortunately, we cannot infinitely increase the, the cross section uh, of the structure. Uh, we can also change the shape of this cross section. But if we consider that the most commonly beam bridges, uh, then we know uh, that we are dealing with a classic bending case. And yet for almost 200 years, we already know what shape is optimal for bending. Of course, it is an I-beam. Except that's the problem that very rarely we can use pure I-beams in bridges. We have usually a, a deck on the top. So, so we can change the static scheme. Instead of freely supported beam, we can use a continuous beam or a frame. We can use arched or truss girders. We can use even more sophisticated schemes such as cable state or suspension bridges. And we do it. We are still looking for new systems. And this is how extra those bridges were invented recently at the end of 20th century. And of course, we can always use more robust and strong materials. And we still do it, too. Concrete and steel are much stronger today than they were a hundred years ago. We already have polymer composites with even greater strength than steel. Well, but all that I have mentioned so far is still just a, a passive action of the designer. He could only passively respond to increasing external loads from vehicles. So far, the civil engineer did not have the opportunities that machines and robot designers had from very beginning. They, they can actively counteract various types of power cylinders or artificial muscles in their robots. This option, this option is only given to us by applying tensioning. And not only just concrete, because, because we can prestress almost any structure. Well, tensioning is a proactive response to external loads. And, and we should remember that this is also a load, but it works contrary uh, to the classic load. The design must safely, the final design, the final structure must safely transfer the combined action of this power system, both external and from tensioning, from tendons. Let's compare reinforced and pre-stressed concrete in more detail. Let's start with concrete. Mm, with tensioning, we must uh, use higher classes of concrete. We are introducing some additional load, so we need to have a higher reserve in concrete strength. So we start properly from uh, class C37. We use a different type of steel for tensioning. It is a high carbon steel. And classing reinforcing steel is not suitable for tensioning because it has too much uh, ductility. This steel um, also has a much higher strength from 800 to 1800 megapascals compared to a maximum of 500 megapascals megapascal reinforcing bars. Uh, Prestressing uh, allows us to reduce the consumption of concrete by 40 to 70 percent concerning the reinforced concrete structure. We can also reduce uh, the use of reinforcing steel by 30 to 50 percent. It should be remembered uh, that uh, prestressing steel is almost three times more expensive than reinforcing steel. It is also not possible to, to design a pre-stress structure without reinforcement. Uh, if we compress concrete, uh, we can control the occurrence of cracks. Uh, it, is, it is a bit worse with a fire resistance, unfortunately. 
Uh, the prestressed structure is more sensitive to the heavy heating of the structure. Uh, after all, more stress is present in the cross section. However, already in the case of fatigue, prestressed concrete has higher resistance uh, because there are no cracks and therefore no notches. All this means that by compressing, uh, by tensioning the structure, we can we can achieve much longer, larger spans. Record-breaking concrete beam bridges today have spans up to 300 meters, while reasonable spans of reinforced concrete bridges are only 30 meters. And then uh, comes the weighty and uneconomical construction. Well, tensioning uh, is, is not an entirely new idea that appeared in the 20th century. Uh, let's look at uh, these wooden wheels and barrels. How was it possible to use them in the past? Why did uh, the wheels not fall apart on the leaky roads in the Middle Ages and the barrels kept watertight? Uh, thanks to, the, to their compression, um, but a slightly different method than we do today. Uh, Will Wright or Cooper uh, first heated a steel rim and then put it on a wheel or a barrel. The cooling edge changed its diameter by clamping wooden spokes or staves. It was compression with a method of thermal treatment. Tensioning is not an entirely new idea that appeared in the 20th century. Uh, let's look at these wooden wheels or barrels. How was it possible to use them in the past? Why did, did uh, the wheels not fall apart on the leaky roads in the Middle Ages and the barrels kept watertight? Thanks to their compression but a slightly different method than we do today. A wheelwright or a cooper first heated a steel rim and then put it on a wheel or a barrel. The cooling edge changed its diameter by clamping wooden spokes or staves. It was compression, it was tensioning with a method of thermal treatments. The first tensioning experiments uh, appeared together with the first reinforced concrete structures. From the very beginning, engineers tried to prestress the reinforced bars. But unfortunately, these attempts were very unsuccessful. First, the steel used at that time had insufficient strength and high ductility. So you couldn't apply too much force. Besides, uh, we didn't know at that time certain uh, rheological phenomena that cause uh, delayed loss of prestressing force. Therefore, the first prestress structures collapsed very quickly and, and were unable to survive even two or three years. It is widely believed that uh, the father of prestressing is Eugène Freycinet a French engineer who in 1930 patented the, the anchoring system using cones and retaining blocks, which after minor modifications are used today by almost all corporations offering tensioning systems. Uh, the, the rapid development of this technology occurred in 1950s when after the Second World War in Europe and there was a shortage of, of structural steel for the reconstruction of damaged bridges. And the prestressing allowed the use of concrete also at larger spans. In Poland, however, uh, the development of prestressing didn't take place until 1990, uh, in, uh, political transformation, uh, because earlier this technology was covered by the embargo directed against communist countries. We were previously 
uh, and the Warsaw Pact, which was ruled by Soviet Russia. Similarly, we couldn't use the latest computers or even CAD techniques. Officially, we couldn't uh, even buy AutoCAD in Poland that time. We used the following basic materials to construct prestressed concrete bridges. First is, of course, concrete, then reinforcing steel, prestressing steel, sometimes fiber reinforced polymers called FRP, and finally grouts for for injection. Here we have um, basic methods of tensioning. So uh, we can stress with tendons and here uh, we have two primary techniques. Before placing the concrete it is pre-tensioning. In the first stage we, we lay the reinforcement in, in the empty formwork and stress the prestressing tendons anchored to the external resistance blocks. Then we put the concrete and after its hardening cut the strands, thus transferring the prestressing force to the prefabricated beam. As you can see um, it bends upwards because the tie rods are in the lower section, just like it was in our spong we started the lecture today. The second method of tensioning with tendons is post-tensioning, uh, in which we stress tendons after laying concrete. In the first phase, we install reinforcement and empty shields for prestressing cables on the scaffolding and then lay the concrete. After achieving sufficient compressing strength of concrete, we put the, the tendons in, into the hollow channels and stress them. After anchoring, the system is now is, is self-supporting and we can remove the formwork and scaffoldings. We can also compress uh, stress with, with tend without tendons using the reaction between retaining blocks, wedges or expansive concrete. We can also use some special procedures, like, like th thermal ones, as uh, Will Wright or Cooper did. It's just uh, that we had heat reinforcement or steel profiles inside the structure. Let's look again at the stages of pre-tensioned uh, precast concrete. Uh, these are mostly prefabricated bridge beams. In the first stage, we lay the reinforcement in the formwork and stress the tendons, often in the factory. Uh, these are long formworks that can, can have several beams in the length. Uh, then we put concrete and treat it, waiting for the required compressing strength to be achieved. When it happens, we cut out, cut out the sticking tendons uh, that are still under tension. In this way, uh, the prestressing force is transferred to the beam due to friction be between steel and, and concrete. And now is this actually ready for transport and rests on the store. Of course, we are adequately supported uh, because uh, it must be adequately supported because the whole element is very tight, is uh, stressed and ultimately not loaded. Uh, therefore, any error in support on lifting may result in damage to, to the prefabricated item. In the case of post-tension concrete, most often we deal with a monolithic method used at the construction site. First, we install scaffolding and formworks. We can see them empty yet without, without reinforcement. Then uh, we put in uh, the reinforcement and all empty ducts for the prestressing cables. They can be seen in this video uh, in the form of silver corrugated pipes. Resistant blocks are mounted on the ends uh, and, and the anchorage zones are additionally reinforced.
and the next stage we lay concrete vibrating it to fill uh, the spaces around the cables accurately uh, well, the, the upper surface uh, must be well leveled with a corresponding lateral deck inclinations on the top uh, now we have to wait for achieving sufficient compressive strength of concrete of course treating it uh, we can also use this time to insert prestressing tendons into empty ducts with the ends of such devices that allow inserting further tendons into the duct well, we start stressing with individual hydraulic jacks and arc on each cable on the external resistant blocks. Uh, the final stage is the injection of prestressing tendons, which is to protect them against corrosion and ensure even better adhesion to concrete. Cable ends are cut off and secured with a cover and concreted. They will no longer be available or visible. Let's compare uh, two basic tensioning methods using tendons, namely pre-stress concrete and post-tensioned concrete. The moment of tensioning is in the pre-stress concrete occurs before the concrete is laid on the external retaining blocks and it post-tension after concrete has been laid and hardened. Anchoring is carried out uh, in pre-stress concrete by friction of tendons on concrete and in post tension mainly by pressure on anchor blocks pre-stress concrete elements are usually used in factories although of course we can imagine temporary stands in the area of the construction site however post tension components uh, can be made both in factories and on construction sites which is usually the case with bridges in pre-stress concrete the tendons are only straight. The tendons are also run entirely in the concrete. There is no other way. In post tension, however, we have almost complete freedom in shaping the, ge the cable geometry, which can be curved and can be located both in concrete cross section and outside. Prestress concrete elements must be transported in there um, entirely. Uh, while post tension comp components can be divided into segments which are then connected on the construction site with final cables this enforces restriction on the length of prefabricated elements prestressed beams reach up to 40 meters in length uh, and the prestressed concrete beams are usually up to 12 meters long because because they they are easier to transport it also defines the application ranges. Uh, Prestress concrete are often shorter beams and slabs, small railway sleepers, columns, and culverts. Uh, however, post tension doesn't have such restrictions because cables are used to stress monolithic structures such as beams, slabs, frames, arches, retaining walls, ground anchors, etc. Uh, I'd like to show you the essential elements of the post-tension concrete system, which is most often used in bridges. The first is uh, casing, or uh, ducts, uh, used to shape cable channels. Today these are, these are corrugated pipes with different diameters depending on the power of the cable. When laying, be careful not to damage them. Uh, a band may occur when we stand on them during assembly of the reinforcement. You can also accidentally burn a hole by welding reinforcements. In both cases, we may have a problem later when inserting the next cable uh, strands. Here we have tendons that form the entire cable inserted in, into the empty channel empty duct created by the corrugated casing pipe. Uh, they are delivered to the construction site in the form of coils from which we unwind uh, the individual tendon. We need a special device for threading uh, cable in to insert tendons. Most often we use insertion. Uh, 
now try to imagine the situation that by add, adding the last tendon of 19 stranded cable it turns out that it can no longer be inserted somewhere along the length of the of the duct uh, was bent or after burning the whole concrete got inside it's a serious matter uh, and you can't go without searching for this place and forging concrete takes a lot of time uh, we, we mount anchoring blocks at the ends of the cables uh, we distinguish active blocks to which we have the option of applying or prestressing jack and anchoring the cable uh, we also have dead blocks uh, that do not have a backplate but a separate strands uh, with hooks uh, here we have no way of putting the jack and such cable is therefore one side tension only. We also use the special connectors that allow the cable to be extended at the end of the active block of the previously stressed cable. We mount the connector which is also the dead block of the next cable. We introduce the prestressing force using hydraulic jacks sets with, uh, with uh, hydraulic sets with jacks. Uh, with typical cables consisting of 19 tendons, as we usually use in Poland, uh, the jacks are already so big and heavy that we have to use cranes to maneuver. Finally, uh, finally we need to inject stressed cables. For this we need a special equipment for the production of cement mortar, which then we give uh, under pressure with injectors. Of course, you also need a rubber or a plastic pipe system uh, with teeth and veils. Finally, some examples of prestress concrete bridges, uh, which, as I said, are currently being the most common in the world. Uh, here you can see prestressing tendons and anchorages together with the reinforcement. Uh, a giant stressing jack during operation. Uh, fastening individual tendons to the prestressing jack and a prefabricated bridge segment that will be prestressed to the to the previous segment. Uh, it is thanks to the tensioning that we can build such a large bridges over wide rivers and bays today uh, without without the need for scaffolding. This is the end of today's lecture. Now we end with one of the longest and the highest post tension bridges in Europe, which is Karoshegi Viaduct along Balaton in Hungary. I'm sure that you had a chance to, to drive on it during your last trip uh, to holiday somewhere in Balkan countries on the south. Now, thank you for the attention and see you on the next lecture in the series of Bridges to the Future.